On a clear, moonless night, far from the nearest city, you will find the sky littered with tiny points of light. Most of these points are stars in the Milky Way galaxy, but a few may be planets in our own solar system. These specks of light induce in the mind of a curious person a cascading series of questions. What are these stars made of? How far away are they? How old are they? How did they form? And how will they die? How shall we go about answering these questions? For that matter, how can we go about answering these questions? Let's consider the specific question of how the stars actually formed in the first place. According to young Earth creationists, the answer to the question of where the stars came from has been in the possession of the human race for more than 3,000 years. You see, there is a historical document that gives an eyewitness account of how all the stars in the universe came to be. It was written by the very person who made the stars themselves and put them in the sky. Today this chronicle is found in the Bible, in particular in Genesis chapter 1 verses 14 through 19. It is worth reading this passage in full, so I will read it from the NIV translation. And God said, Let there be light in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. Young Earth creationists interpret this to mean that all of the stars in the universe were created supernaturally by God in a single 24-hour day just 6,000 years ago. This obviously contradicts the mainstream scientific consensus that stars form by completely natural processes and have been forming continuously for the last 13.613 billion years. How do creationists reconcile their interpretation of Genesis with the findings of modern science? They redefine science so that stuff like the formation and evolution of stars, planets, and galaxies cannot be studied by the scientific method. The basic idea is to define science as the study of phenomena that you can directly observe in laboratory experiments. So, for instance, star formation would be outside the scope of science because, one, no human being alive today would have been around when the stars that we see in the present formed, two, star formation takes longer than the lifetime of an individual scientist and hence can't be directly observed, and three, scientists can't study star formation by creating a star in the laboratory. All of this misses the whole point of doing science. Science is all about learning stuff about the world that we could never know if we were limited by our five senses. We can't see electrons, but we know they exist, and we even know their properties like mass and charge. No one has ever taken a thermometer to the center of the sun, and yet we know the temperature there. No one has ever journeyed to the center of the earth, and yet we know that the earth has a solid inner core and a liquid outer core. Of course, ultimately, we must connect the phenomena that lie beyond our direct experience to something that we can perceive with our five senses. So, for example, while we can't see an electron, we can see the trail it leaves behind in a cloud chamber, and we can use the detailed properties of the trail to infer the electron's intrinsic properties. In the specific instance of determining the properties of electrons, we were able to do repeatable experiments in the laboratory. We could create as many electrons as we wanted, with whatever velocities we wanted, and directly observe how magnetic and electric fields of various strengths and orientations affect the electron's trajectory. We don't have the luxury to do this kind of thing in astronomy. We can't study stars, planets, or galaxies by creating them in the laboratory and manipulating their environments. Fortunately, in astronomy, there is a very easy way to get around this problem. While we can't make a single star, planet, or galaxy, the universe has made billions upon billions of each of these entities. With instruments attached to telescopes, we can measure the properties of these astronomical objects. For example, we can measure the mass, surface temperature, radius, luminosity, rotation period, and chemical composition of stars. If we do this for a bunch of stars, 
we will find that the different properties of stars are not free to vary independently, but are highly correlated. There is a standard way to visualize these correlations. We construct a two-dimensional space whose y-coordinate corresponds to one property of a star and whose x-coordinate corresponds to another property. Then each star corresponds to a single point in this space. In astronomy, the simplest and most commonly used such diagram is called the HR diagram. Luminosity is plotted on the vertical axis, while surface temperature is plotted on the horizontal axis, although for some reason the temperature decreases from left to right. Since every star has a definite surface temperature and luminosity, every star shows up as a single point on the HR diagram. If you plot, say, all the stars within a certain distance of the sun on an HR diagram, you will find that the stars are not randomly distributed throughout the diagram, but only populate certain regions. This is our first example of a correlation, or at least a pattern, showing up between two properties of an astronomical object. Most of the stars will be on a band called the main sequence that extends from the top left to the bottom right. A few other regions will be populated, and these are given names like red giant, horizontal branch, asymptotic giant branch, red and blue supergiant, and white dwarfs. What are we to make of the distribution of stars on the HR diagram? Well, in creationism, the locations of stars on the HR diagram are completely arbitrary. They are located wherever God wanted them to be located. For his own mysterious reasons, God made most of the stars to be main sequence stars. He also made some red giants, super giants, and white dwarfs. But he could have just as easily made most of the stars blue super giants, or half of the stars white dwarfs. Most people don't find this explanation very satisfying. One can't help but wonder if there is a less arbitrary explanation for the HR diagram, one in which the properties of the diagram are inevitable logical consequences of some fundamental principles. Indeed, that is exactly the kind of explanation that modern science gives us. All scientific explanations are based on the same template. At every moment in time, the universe is in some state and the state of the universe changes with time in a manner which is completely determined by the laws of physics. Exactly how the state of the universe is characterized depends on which physical theory you are using. In Newtonian mechanics, for example, it may be the position and velocity of every particle. The laws of physics would then be rules that govern how the position and velocity of particles change with time. In more modern theories, the details are more complicated, but the basic principle is the same. We can use this template in astronomy to explain the correlations and patterns that arise when we measure the properties of a bunch of objects of the same type. We follow the following four steps. 1. Postulate some initial state. 2. Postulate the laws of physics that govern how the state of the system changes with time. 3. Calculate how the initial state would change with time if the postulated laws of physics were true. And 4 compare the calculated final state of the system with the astronomical observations. In practice, the initial state of the system has to be indirectly inferred from observations. The laws of physics used in step 2 should be based on the laws of physics as determined by laboratory experiments on Earth. Powerful supercomputers have to be used to calculate how the initial state of the system changes with time. This is why computer simulations are used so much in astronomy. Finally, in order to compare the model predictions with observations, you will probably have to run the simulation on many different systems with slightly different properties. For example, if you want to reproduce the HR diagram, you will need to simulate the evolution of stars of different masses and chemical compositions. The scientific method is an iterative procedure, so the above steps must be repeated. In the first iteration of this process, at best, the models will only be able to predict the overall properties of whatever phenomena they were meant to describe. The exact details will either not be predicted at all, or will not be predicted correctly. This is a normal part of science that cannot be avoided. Creationists love to attack a theory when it predicts a value for a quantity that is not exactly equal to the observed value. They will ignore all of the correct predictions and say that the incorrect prediction entirely falsifies the theory. However, this is not how science is done. And in fact, science cannot be done this way. There is no way that you are going to correctly guess all of the postulates of the theory needed to explain the properties of the system you are studying on your first iteration of the scientific method. 
All you can hope for, at first, is to figure out the principles that govern the overall behavior of the system. Only after many iterations of this cycle will you have a comprehensive theory that accurately describes every detail of the system. The HR diagram is but the simplest example of patterns and correlations in astronomical observations that can be used to empirically test scientific models of the formation and evolution of astronomical objects. There are correlations between rotational velocity and luminosity in spiral galaxies, between velocity dispersion and luminosity in elliptical galaxies, between redshift and distance to galaxies, between carbon abundance and iron abundance in stars, and much more. These data points are explained by modern, secular scientific theories involving the origin and evolution of astronomical objects. They are logical consequences of the laws of physics turning the initial state of the universe into its present state. But from the point of view of creationism, they will forever be unexplained, or perhaps explained as the result of a completely arbitrary choice made in the mind of the creator of the universe. Let's return to the topic of this series, the formation of stars. What astronomical observations are available to compensate for the inability to create stars in the laboratory and thus study the star formation process experimentally? As it turns out, quite a lot. We live in a galaxy that is actively forming stars. Even as I say these words, there are stars in virtually every stage of the formation process scattered across the Milky Way. Astronomers have been carefully observing these star formation sites, cataloging the detailed properties of these systems. These observations are exactly what we need to develop and test a comprehensive theory of star formation. In this series, I want to describe what we know about how those tiny points of light that dot the night sky came to be, and how we know this. We will address common creationist misconceptions, as well as honestly discuss what we still don't know about the star formation process.